Question. How many expansions can you fit to a ZX Spectrum? Well, I suppose since there is just the single slot on the back, you might be forgiven for thinking the answer is one. And I suppose for the most part that single expansion slot is really all you need, be it for a joystick interface, something like this, or some other piece of hardware, say something like this diagnostic cart. One expansion slot, that does the job. But I recently had a situation where I thought I would need to connect two expansions to this machine at the same time. And that came around when putting this together. This is the ZX T SID. I'm sure you've seen the video on this a couple of weeks ago. Essentially emulates a SID chip, hangs out the back of your Spectrum and lets you play SID files. Well, I say that, but this is designed to hang out the back of a 1 to 8K Spectrum. This one here is just a 48K Spectrum. But I have one of these. This little expansion that was very kindly donated quite a while ago now actually coming up to perhaps a year ago. This was donated by Tyrell. Oh, thank you very much for that. Although apologies it has taken me so long to get there. This is a memory expansion for the ZX Spectrum that will make this a 1 to 8K machine. But as you can see there is no means on this of plugging this into the back of the Spectrum and then say connecting another expansion such as our SID card. There is no pass through. So I went on the hunt. Is there anything that we can do to allow me to connect two or possibly even more expansions to this machine at the same time? Well, after much searching over on projectspecky.com in the projects section, I found something that I thought looked pretty cool. The Sinclair Spectrum Backplane. So Steve, who runs this website, he references an article that he found in a magazine many years ago showing this backplane. Now this one allows the connection of multiple accessories. I only need to connect two accessories to my Spectrum. But Steve came up with this board that should allow us to connect a total of six expansions. This bit connects to the Spectrum there are two pass-throughs directly on this board and then four further expansions. So I downloaded the Gerbers, the Bill of Materials and a few weeks later we have this to put together. As well as the components that you see here, these aren't fitted yet, they're just sitting there in the holes. We need to solder it all in in a minute. But as well as those, I have some pin headers to go in there for these things. There are two different types. These ones are intended to be installed like that, or well, like that actually, to allow expansion cards like our ROM expansion to be installed. This type is meant to go on vertically to allow the likes of the diagnostic cart to plug in like that. All these components that you see here, these are just associated with powering this board. There is a jumper block that will be fitting here to select either deriving power off the spectrum or off this external supply. I dare say you'd be okay powering maybe a couple of expansions off the spectrum's internal supply. But if you're going to say fit out all six possible expansions here, well, you probably want to use the external supply. But all parts are there for it anyway, so we're just going to solder it all up. No time like the present. Let's just get it done.
So this will plug in here. Let's hook up some power. I suppose we may as well hook up a video signal. And watch out for any magic smoke. So Spectrum still starts up okay. That's good. Let's just take a look at those voltages. 5 volt and yep that is pretty much bang on where we need it to be. What about the other ones though? 9 volt that sits here just beside 5 volt. It's actually a bit high. Although that's being derived you know from this. So I suppose it is what it is. Where's the 12 volt? 12 volt is on this side. It is handily labelled here for us. That looks pretty good. 12 volts. Negative 5 is just a couple of pins up from that. Should be that one. And yeah, there it is. That's fine. So power is getting out into our expansion down the full length of it. Let's try and plug something in, shall we? How about we try the diagnostic cart? This is getting so long now that I can barely fit it all in the frame. But let's see what it does. Well, everything still lights up, although we now have garbage on the screen. Let's try that again. And this time it's working okay. So what was that all about? Maybe just a dodgy connection? But no, I don't think this is working right. Something is wrong here. It should not be stuck on that screen for this length of time. So that LED is on, although you maybe can't see it, but we do have 5 volt on the breakout board itself. Let's power up the spectrum. And wow, that is not any of the happy. After not having much luck with our backplane, I decided the best thing to do would be put this to the side, have a think about it, and complete a couple of little modifications to our spectrum itself. Now I had no intention of recording said modifications just because they are fairly straightforward things, or so I thought. First one was just tidy up a composite mod. Previously I had just taken a wire off the board in through the RF modulator and out that jack. But it is better to have a capacitor in there that's a 100 microfarad cap and that just provides a little bit of protection to the ULA, the composite video signals coming straight out of there. That capacitor there just gives it a little bit of protection. The other thing was replacing these caps down here on the lower RAM. As doing that supposedly improves the composite video signal, helps with jail bars, although as you'll see shortly, I don't really think it's made much, if any, difference. And then the other mod that I wanted to do to my board here is the DC-DC mod. My Spectrum is an issue 3B, but Sinclair also released an issue 4 board, which has a slight difference in the PSU side of the board here. It's up here where the negative 5 and 12 volt reels are generated, and the keen eyed might be able to tell that my issue 3B now doesn't have any DC DC mod on it. That's because every time I did that mod, it wouldn't work. Now there's nothing particularly complicated about it, it is just swapping out a couple of capacitors, resistors and diodes. You're essentially just altering the circuit here so that it matches what is in the later issue 4 board. But every time I did that mod, well, the negative 5 volt reel, it dropped to about negative 4.6, so a little low, but supposedly should have been okay. The 12 volt reel though, well, it dropped to about 8 volts. So why was it doing that? I honestly have no idea. The only things on here using 12 volt is the lower RAM and the video encoder. Interestingly, if I removed the lower RAM chips, that 12 volt reel would jump up to about 10 volts. Still way too low for the RAM to work properly. But the fact that it was 8 volts with these in here increases to 10 volts with them out of there and it's supposed to be 12 volts, well that makes me think that something that I did in the modification here 
was current limiting that 12 volt rail. And with the amount of current being drawn by these chips, we were getting the volt drop. The only thing is though, I've been through essentially all those components there and everything tests fine. Even went to the trouble of trying another power supply. Even tried replacing the electrolytic capacitors here, although this whole board was recapped when I initially got it. But tried replacing them anyway, didn't make any difference. Even tried another 7805, and though no, that didn't make any difference either. And yeah, that was three days of my life that I'm never getting back. So I wound up just reverting this back to the way it was. In fact, I actually reverted it back to stock, tested it, all the voltages were fine, and did the DC-DC mod again, and the problem still persisted. So it was original, then modified, then original, then modified, and now it's just back to original. Oh well. If anyone has any ideas why that wasn't working for me, please let me know. But over the course of those three days, I have managed to figure out something about our backplane. And it may well be the case that the issues we were having initially might have just been down to connectivity. Or well, partially just down to connectivity. And the reason that I say it like that is because it will now always get to the diagnostic screen. The lower ROM, that always passes. The ROM, that always passes. The upper ROM, well, it usually passes the first three tests. Walk test, inversion test and march test. But when it gets to the random test, well, it normally crashes. Now, as you can see, it is just trying its very best to make a complete fool out of me because it has for some reason this time passed the random test. That is the first time it's done that. So we'll just pretend we didn't see that and hit reset. Okay, so the lower RAM that passes, the ROM that passes, but when it gets to the upper RAM tests, well the first three, they normally always pass, but when it gets to that random test, well look at that, it fails. And this time it's blaming IC25 and 26, the upper RAM multiplexers, that is the LS157s. It will either blame them, or sometimes it tries to blame the RAM chips themselves. Back when I first got this machine, it did have a couple of faults. And one of those problems was with the upper RAM. Two of those chips were bad, and I replaced those two with new 4164s. But one thing that we can try is that I have a load more of those new chips. So let's pull out the remaining six originals. And we'll fit six of these new chips. And does that make any difference? Random test. Nope, it has crashed again. Okay, I'm going to do this another few times. And let's just see what it does. Yeah, it just continues to fail more or less every time. Either just straight crash, or it's telling me the RAM chips themselves are bad, or more often than not, it's saying that the two multiplexers are bad, IC25 and IC26. Yep, there it goes. It crashed again, blaming the multiplexers again. So it doesn't really seem to work anyway reliably with the upper ROM that's on the board here. Although, as you know, we're going to be fitting this memory expansion to make this a 128K system. And to fit this, we need to disable the upper ROM on this board. And doing that is straightforward. All we need to do is jump over between 5V on IC23 here. So pin 14 of IC23. We need to jump with that across to pin 5. And I'm going to do that just by removing the chip and sticking a little bit of wire into the sockets there, just between those pins. So we'll stick this into pin 5. That will go in there, and then the other side I need to take up to position 14. Now granted that is sort of just sitting there, but Hopefully when we put the chip back in, that will hold it in place. 
And let's just confirm that with the meter. 14, five. Yeah, that's working okay. So if we power that on at that, it should tell us that it thinks this is a 16K spectrum. Yep, this appears to be a 16K spectrum, so that's working. Let's stick our memory expansion on. And if we power this up again, it should now work as a 48K spectrum again. It won't think it's 128K spectrum just because of the ROM. Although if this is all working as I think it should be, there should now be 128K of RAM available. So yeah, it thinks it's a 48K. It's going through the upper RAM test, but it's testing that on this thing now. And it passed. Okay, how about we give it a reset and see what it does this time. Walk test passed, inversion test passed, march test passed, random test passed. Two for two. Well, it passed the third time though. Yes. I've been trying to load a bit of software, a modified version of these diagnostics that's on this cart to allow us to test the 128K of RAM on this expansion. That's loaded from a top file via the ear input jack here. But unfortunately, every single time that I try to load that, it crashes. So I've got this in here just to give you a visual representation of what's going on. But if we try to load said top file, and I'm doing that from my tablet here using ZX Play, well, as you can see, it doesn't do very much. In fact, this time it's not even attempting to load. Now you may think to yourself, well, that could just be down to spectrums on trying to load tap files such as I am. But if I remove our backplane and instead just put the 128K ROM expansion directly onto the spectrum, everything else is exactly the same as it was. And if we try to load that same top file now, well, there it goes. It is loading fine. ZX Diagnostics. Yeah, there it goes. This time though, we can select what version of Spectrum we have. We're going to select 128K because we wanted to do 128K tests on this ROM. So number two, and I'll just go through and test the RAM banks. And there we are, all 128K of RAM passed fine. Now it doesn't quite make it a true Spectrum 128K. Obviously that machine has a different ULA in it and runs a different ROM. You just can't stick the 128K ROM into your 48K Spectrum. It is missing some of the logic required to drive that ROM. This thing has a 16K ROM in it. The 128's ROM is 32K, so there's additional logic in there to switch between those two 16K banks. You might be able to add it to this machine. I'm not too sure, but that will be the subject for another day. As for this thing though, well, what are we gonna do? So I reached out to Steve who created this board just to see if he had any ideas why we're having all these problems. He did tell me that the one he built for himself, he hasn't had any such issues, it just seems to work fine. But the one thing that might be causing the problems is the lack of buffering. If you compare this to the images of the backplane from that magazine article, well, there are several ICs down towards the spectrum connector, and the assumption would be that those are doing buffering of all these signals. On this board, there is no such thing. Those signals are just coming out through the edge connector, down these traces, and we are relying on the logic inside the little spectrum itself to drive all that. And the other potential problem, I suppose, is 
that we're adding, what, six inches here of PCB hanging out the back of our spectrum. There's no termination or anything of any of these traces. So would this be like connecting a large aerial to the back of your spectrum, plugging that directly into your address and data bus, say, and then wondering why it's not working properly? So what can we do to try and address this? Well, we should look at adding buffers, although we're starting to get into the realms of going above my head. And especially when we're referring to signals that need to talk in both directions, bi-directional stuff. But certainly for the likes of the address bus, that will be easy enough to buffer. We can just use the likes of 74LS244s for that. And we can leave them permanently enabled. The address bus is purely driven by the CPU. So it doesn't need to be bi-directional. There'll be nothing connected to this that will be writing to that bus. So it'll just be reading off it. So if I lift all the pins on our edge connector here, if I lift all of those that are associated with the address bus, we can pass that through a couple of 244s. There are 16 address lines in total, A0 through A15. So I think we'll just need two chips. Well, there's our two buffers on the address lines. Two 74LS 244s, permanently enabled, um, passing through the 16 address lines. I'm not going to tell you how long this took. But let's just say it took long enough that I hope this now works. So it still starts up, and that's a good thing. At least we know our buffers here, they're working. And it's passed all the tests. So off to a good start, although it did do this on us earlier. So let's hit reset and see what it does the second time. Walk test passed. Inversion test, pass. March test, pass. Random test, pass. Okay, that is two for two. Has definitely not done this before when using the upper RAM on the board itself. So let's go for another reset. One pass, two pass, three pass. Oh, I thought it was going to pass there. I know it has failed the game. So yeah. Our buffers don't seem to have done very much. Maybe it is a case that we would need to also buffer the data lines. In fact, maybe we need to buffer every signal coming into this. So yeah, that is kind of disappointing. Let me do the modification again at IC23 and we'll test it with the 128K ROM expansion. And yeah, same as last time really, with the upper RAM on the board disabled, instead we're using the expansions RAM, it passes every time. It's been around three times here, and it's fine. Yeah, fourth time, and it just continues to pass. Let's try and load the other diagnostic suite. And it's just crashed straight away. Honestly, the second that I pushed play on this app, on the tablet, it's just fell over. So yeah, it's certainly no better than it was before. Adding those buffers seems to have done nothing. Well, still no further with getting this to work, but I have at least now solved the issue with the powering of this remotely. Remember when we tried to use its own built-in power supply, well it just threw garbage on the screen and just corrupted everything on us. If I instead power this directly off my bench power supply, so an isolated supply, well, it seems to work fine. So there's a 5 volt on to this board, it's generating that internally. Well, I'm feeding 9 volts into it, and the regulator here, that's generating the 5 volts. Now if we power up the spectrum itself, something just went bang. Let's see that in an instant replay. Something just went bang. 
Yeah, something just went bang. So, so much for having figured that out. And look at that. That corner of transistor 4. That is missing. So, new TR4. And... Yeah, it's not happy, is it? Our voltages are low. Our 12 volts gone. Negative 5 is gone. Pull that out quickly before we lose the lower RAM. If we haven't lost it already. Something else in here, it must have went pop at the same time. I wonder, has TR5 give up? So another new TR4 and a new TR5 this time. It still seems to work. Thank goodness for that. At least we didn't fry the lower RAM. As for this thing though, to be perfectly honest with you, I think I'm done with it. Shut up. I want to go back to something that I touched on earlier, and that is termination. And the fact that our backplane here, it doesn't have any. So having a quick chat with some of the guys over on More Fun Making It's Discord. And Mogway over there, well, he pointed towards this website. And this is an article from one Dr. Scott Baker. He was trying to sort out some stability issues on an old computer in 8088. But if we scroll down this, he talks about passive ISA bus termination. The fact that it's an ISA bus has nothing to do with it. It's just passive bus termination. And indeed, this article even references that the idea came from a backplane manual. We have got a backplane with problems. So it is relatively straightforward. All this recommends that we do is install a few resistors between 5 volt and ground and the bus. So I'm going to try it just on the data bus because we have buffered the address bus. 330 ohms to 5 volt and 470s to ground. Just made it easy for myself, connected them up to those two expansion slots there. But is that going to make the difference? Well, let's try and find out. No, not really. It doesn't seem to like my modification. Well, I've tried a few different values, but when we got to 1000 ohm, connected to the data bus on 5 volt, and 680 between the data bus and ground, well, this time it came up and it seems to be stable. The upper RAM on the board in here is still disabled, if I'm correct. So let's hook up the memory expansion and let's try and load that other version of the diagnostic software that will let us test the 128K RAM on there. So far we have not been able to successfully load any software while this backplane is connected. But this time it seems to be working. Found the program. Oh yes. Oh yes. Takes a minute to load. So let's just see what it does. And it has successfully loaded. I'm going to bother with soak test mode. But let's just run us through the 128K RAM test. Yeah, testing complete, everything passes. Fantastic. But you know what we're going to have to test? Does this work if we re-enable the onboard upper RAM? Okay, I've removed the jumper link in there, so that should be this RAM enabled. Ooh, no, that's my fault. There we are. That is one comment actually, one additional comment I'll make about this backplane. That slot in it is quite wide, so there is scope for the cards you insert to be off slightly and shorting between some pins. Not exactly ideal, but 
let's see what it does. Will the upper RAM random test, will that pass? Come on. Yes. Okay, one pass. Will it do it again though? Yes, it does. Third time, it has never done three times. Yes, might be too early to call it, but it does seem as if this is working. Had to swap things around slightly, but it's loading now. Not really sure what the problem was, to be honest. But for some reason, it didn't like it with the SIG card over here and the memory card over there. Or, well, I said it's loading now, but it looks like it's just crashed. Well, unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to work. But I'm not so sure now that our problem with the NZ software is actually anything to do with the backplane. Rather, I think it might just be a case that that software not only requires 128K of memory, but also requires the 128K spectrum itself, just for those other subtle differences, such as that different ULA. And I think that garbage on the screen, those sort of lines on the screen, if I had to guess, I would say that's the menu system from the NSID software trying to be displayed, but the ULA in here doesn't support the screen mode that the 128K does, and so it's just not working. But I do want to try and get something working today with two devices connected to this. So I have fixed the joystick adapter. So let's try and plug this in. And let's instead try to run a game. And how about we go for a classic that I certainly remember playing back in the day on my MSX. How about we try and load Hunchback. Yeah, that's loading fine. There it goes. But this is going to be four minutes. Tape loading error. Well, it unfortunately will not load anything with two devices connected to this. It just does not want to work. Loaded Hunchback fine with joystick adapter disconnected but if I was to plug this in it just does not want to know. Just constantly fails while loading if it even starts to load at all. Tried adding a couple of caps in between 5 volt and ground to try and smooth things out on this board a little bit but nope that isn't making any difference. I mean I suppose we could try something that is not recommended. We could try and plug this in with the spectrum going. Sure, if it blows up, it'll just be more fun, won't it? Okay, we got that connected there. Everything does seem to be running still. And yes, it is working. Oh no, he spoke too soon. It's crashed it. And if we reset. And try to load this again now with this connected. Everything else is exactly as it was. Just does not work. Endlessly frustrating. Out of everything that we've done to try and get this working, the only thing that seems to have made much difference is the termination. Adding those resistors between 5 volt and ground on the data bus. The buffers here on the address bus, they've done practically nothing. And trying to power this board separately using all of this, well all that does is make things go bang. So how about we strip it right back and try it with only that termination on the data bus. No buffers, no onboard power, 
although all that is disabled anyway when that jumper is in the internal position. But with none of that fitted and just the termination, could that possibly make any difference? Well, here's one that I made earlier. We've got our resistors in there, just as before, although this time I didn't bother fitting those expansion sockets. Rather, these are just soldered directly into this board. So, first things first, let's power it up. And all that looks good. So, let's try and load our game again. I'm just going to go with Hunchback again. So, load two of those. Enter. Play. Found the program again and starting to load, although it did do this last time as well, didn't it? But it's never successfully done it with the two devices connected to the backplane. Just using ZX Play again on the tablet. So everything else is just the same. Let's see what happens. Well, it's never got this far before. It's brought the logo on the screen and it's continuing to load. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves because it's still got another three minutes or so to do. Although I will optimistically say it's looking good. And I don't quite believe it, but it has loaded successfully. So this seems to be working now, stripped back as it is. What on this though was causing the problems? I don't think the addition of the buffers is what's causing any issues, because that's just passing those signals straight through. Granted it's a bit of a mess of wires, but it's just passing those address lines straight through into this card. Can't see that being the problem. Equally though, I can't really see any of this being the problem, the power side of it, because it's isolated at the minute with how that jumper is set. Yes, the grounds that are connected to all this is still obviously connected at all times. That's not isolated when that jumper is switched. It's just a 5 volt reel is. But again, I don't really see that being the cause of the problems. The only thing I can maybe put it down to, to be honest with you, and as silly as it sounds, is these. They are just cheapy pin header things that I got from AliExpress. And they are very thin copper inside. It almost looks like a fork inside each of those. Just a single bit of copper comes up and splits into a fork. The pin you put down in there obviously just sits within that fork. So I wonder has it just been a flaky connection all along when we tried to use the termination on this in those. Maybe what I should try doing is removing all of those and just fitting that termination directly to the board here like it is on this one. But our game's loaded so let's just make sure that you know it works. And yeah, it seems to, even though I'm obviously crap at it. Let's see if we can clear the first screen at least. Third time lucky. Oh, can I clear the second screen? No. Game over. Let's try and remove these quickly and uh, see if that makes any difference. Well, I don't quite believe it. But all those nasty looking things have been removed from this. Resistor termination in there and it seems to be working. Unbelievable. I don't think this was the problem all along. I mean, I do think it has been the lacking termination. I do think that has been the issue. And in fact, maybe even those ICs that we've seen on the backplane from that magazine article, maybe they're not buffers. Maybe they are resistor networks providing termination of all the signals on here. And yeah, that's loaded. And it's working fine. Although I still suck at the game. 
So I've been playing with this off and on for most of the day and it seems to be fine. We're currently loading Moon Cresta and yeah, for the most part, loading software now works perfectly. And the reason I say it like that is that you still do get the odd crash sometimes, although I'm not sure if that is actually related to our backplane here or if that's just a spectrum being a spectrum. We are loading from tape or well, loading from ZX Play. I will probably have to get myself one of the SD card loaders and that would be a lot more reliable and another device to plug into our backplane. So I think for today I'm happy enough to call this successful. Even though it has been quite the journey getting here. The board probably could use a little revision just to add in proper termination rather than doing this sort of jankiness and maybe even adding in buffers properly rather than this jankiness. Also need to figure out the power side of it. That bit does sort of have me perplexed a little so if anyone has any ideas on that please let me know. But I think that'll do it for this video. It is definitely getting on in length so if you're still with me thank you very much for sticking with it. As you might be able to tell by the window behind me it is currently in the middle of the night. I have a flight to get in less than four hours heading to Amiga Kickstart, although by the time you see this video that event will be over. So I need to go and try and get a bit of sleep before having to head down to the airport, but I'm just so happy to see this working. You have no idea. Let's see if we can just get into this game for a quick blast. Change to joystick controls and number 6 to start. Joystick. You gotta shoot all those things twice. Shoot them once, then they turn into that other thing, and then you gotta shoot them again. Clear the screen, and then a different type of enemy appears, and it's just rinse and repeat. That is quite hard though. So that will have to do it for this video and thank you very much for watching. This does need another quick visit at some point, needs redesigned slightly I think. So it's maybe something I will try and look at if I can't get the original uh, PCB files. I'm not sure if Steven hasn't hosted on that site or not, I'll take a look. And I did try the SID player again just to see if it would, would now work any better but no. That NZ Player Pro just does not load on the 48K Spectrum, even if said 48K Spectrum now has 128K of memory. But that's going to be it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.